start recording. Hi, good evening. Welcome everyone to our, our fourth session of post-COVID economics. I trust you all received the PDF of last week's PowerPoint that I sent out a few days ago. Topics this session, we'll do a brief review from the last session or two. Uh, an old fish. <laughs> Can people hibernate? <laughs> the Vedas and land value tax, health and wealth, full spectrum tax shift, couple of case studies of land value tax, Swami B on the MIC, rent and the economics of war and peace. So I hope that the lighthearted topics amongst the heavy topics have piqued, piqued your curiosity for session four. We've been using this consciousness framework of the Native American word Watiko, consciousness for self-separated, divided, hierarchical, predatorial, trauma-inducing, and ugly. And we're saying that so many of our institutions are really coming out of that state of consciousness, which is why they, they seem so dysfunctional and, and we can't seem to really solve the poverty and war problems. It's the wrong consciousness and the wrong policies, but we're moving into a time when hopefully there would be more people in the unity consciousness that respects diversity, the circular holistic healing and creates that which is beautiful, the, the true, the good and the beautiful coming together. So these are very different types of principles and policies for post COVID economics than we would have had previously. Last uh, week I introduced you to my favorite Dr. Zach Bush and we talked about uh, how he went from being uh, a leading cancer researcher to uh, the conclusion that so many diseases that emerged a few decades ago were related to uh, glyphosate in agriculture and an agriculture that destroyed the microorganisms in the soil. And hence people were eating food, were eating food that, that generates uh, illness instead of health. So he's now a big uh, advocate for regenerative Agriculture is key to healthy planet and people. Anything you can watch of Dr. Bush, you will learn so much. We also, last session, uh, spent some time on the book, Dissolving Illusions, published seven years ago, uh, Disease, Vaccines, and the Forgotten History. I think that information was so important to us. Uh, so to summarize that in the mid 1800s, there was steady drop in deaths from all infectious diseases decreasing to relatively minor levels by the early 1900s. Dissolving Illusions draws from deep and meticulous research to show that the health improvement came through systems of sanitation, clean water, waste removal, better food, and less stress due to fewer working hours and the prohibition of child labor. So we looked at the, the two narratives that seem to be polarized and opposite, the, the, the germ theory versus the terrain theory. Uh, I would put the economics we're teaching here with terrain theory. Uh, germ theory is like, there's really bad people and that, they're ca causing social problems and we have to arrest and, and massively incarcerate all these bad people. Versus we have an unfair social economic system. It's harming many people. And these people are acting out in bad ways that if we had a fair society, we would not have these bad behaviors leading to massive incarceration. So certainly we're not saying there's not such a thing as bad people or germs. We're saying that we're having the emphasis here on, on, on the terrain. So a little story at 226 years old, Hanukkah was the oldest koi fish ever recorded. Why? I mean, they usually live to be 70 years old. So they've concluded from really analyzing this that environmental factors that contribute to a long lifespan for fish are clean water and a good pond filter, quality koi food, and long cold winters. The cold season will slow down the koi's metabolism drastically. And during this period, the fish may eat very little. In fact, during the coldest winter months, it's recommended to completely stop feeding as described in the Koi Feeding Guide. Now, certainly we could agree that also with humans, good clean water and a good environment is gonna have us 
live healthier and longer. But what about this uh, fasting problem? Well, we are hearing it. We, people, if we look at holistic health, there is a lot of mention of periodic fasting or of decreasing the number of hours of the day so that the body really has a, a relief from digesting food in order then to, to have the immune system take, have more energy to take care of any diseases that, that may be up and coming. So that, that some kind of fasting is actually very good for humans as well. Um, now, what about this hibernation? That seems a little extreme. Do humans hibernate? Early humans may have survived the harsh winters by hibernating. Seasonal damage in bone fossils in Spain suggests Neanderthals and their predecessors follow the same strategy as cave bears. Well, while I only recently came across this information, I did come across a most amazing person. To me, probably the most spectacularly interesting person on earth. Her name is Anastasia. She lives in a, like a kind of a bear cave in Siberia. And she, in those cold Siberian winters, apparently she does hibernate in those simple shelter throughout the winter. And yet she has many uh, amazing uh, psychic and parapsychological abilities. So my friend who was in Scotland, Shirley Ann Hardy, uh, is a, was a teacher and a writer about the same field of economics that we're teaching in this class. And Shirley Ann sent me book about this uh, Siberian Panther, about Anastasia. And uh, I read the book in just a day and I ordered the whole series, which was eight additional books. One of those books is called The Space of Love. As I was reading The Space of Love, I received an email from a woman who said, I'm doing a magazine called Space of Love and I've come across an article by you called uh, On Earth Rights Democracy which is the first chapter of my book, by the way, it was my E.F. Schumacher lecture. Somehow she'd come across it. She said, could I edit it and put it in the Space of Love magazine? And I said, this is so curious because I had just come across this book called Space of Love about Anastasia. And she said, yes, the magazine's about the same ideas. So Space of Love magazine was inspired by the incredible wisdom and vision of an amazing avatar living in the wild of Siberian taiga. Anastasia, introduced to the world by Vladimir Migre and the Ringing Cedars of Russia book series. I cannot find the words to describe what an amazing read this book series is. Migre is a very interesting story about he's, how he stumbled across her and started learning from her. He said, write books about what you're learning and that's how the books came to be. But it covers just about every imaginable field of human endeavor, science, philosophy, religion, uh, gardening, um, history. Uh, and she is an advocate for, for people living on uh, small homesteads, uh, leaving the country as much as possible and having self-reliant homesteads and living very, very closely to nature. So I was just a, a wonderful period of my life at one, when I discovered these books. So at one point, Migre asked Anastasia, who are you? Meaning, where are your people from? What's your ethnic background? What's your tribe? And she stood up strong and tall. And she said, I am Vedic. Whoa, it was thought that the Vedic civilization died out thousands of years ago. Here she was a remnant of the high Vedic holistic unity consciousness civilization of the Indus River Valley and elsewhere, a remnant that had survived through thousands of years with these Vedic teachings. So I wanna tell you this about land tenure in the Vedic age. In ancient times, lawgivers provided their people both with common lands and individual holdings. Their principles, their beliefs was that land is a divine entity, belongs to the whole of mankind. The, the land belongs to all men equally. The whole community holds the region where it lives. And yet land is cultivated by individuals or families, not jointly by a community. 
So it wasn't like a communism. It was like common rights to land, but individual and family use rights to the land, in which case the products that they worked for, the food that they grew uh, and what they made on the land was theirs individually. So more on economic principles, the Vedas, the Vedas and land value taxation. A most surprising feature is the principle of free land of all land, the land value tax, which should be the source of government revenue and expenditure. It is surprising because land value taxation is supposed to be a fairly modern concept. There is a concept of rent or surplus and a higher charge on the more fertile land. That's the author, Kasanis. So I have traced this land value tax policy back through thousands of years and the rise and fall of civilizations. And the fall of civiliz when civilizations were rising, you can see that there was a fair land access. It's one way or the other through land value tax or other ways to fairly share the land. But when a few started grabbing more than the others and living from the unearned income because they grabbed more than their fair share, I was seeing all these social problems and the downfall of that civilization. Very interesting. So Henry George independently discovered from his own quest, his own questioning, he just independently discovered the principles and policies that are really a perennial wisdom teaching. So back to this germ theory, terrain theory. So if we really understand the social economic terrain that we live in and why the water's getting dirty and people are getting sick, both mentally and physically and spiritually, then we can figure out how to have a really good social economic environment where people can be mentally, physically and spiritually healthy. So we saw in the Dissolving Illusions book that it was the sanitation that improved the health of the people who were impoverished. It was clean water. It was having waste removal, lowering work hours. These were many improvements. So how would sanitation and other infrastructure that led to these improvements in health and the standard of living, you know, how would they have been financed in the 1800s when this was happening? Well, income tax was not implemented as a permanent tax until 1913. Cities were cleaning up their own messes. The improvements would have been financed with property taxes. Now we look at our, our all of the distribution of wealth according to classical economics. We covered this in previous sessions. We talked about the corruption of economics, how classical economics had land, labor, capital, and the return to, let, to those with the work. Labor is wages the return to or payment for uh, access to capital resources for production is interest. And the factor of land and resources that was captured is called rent. Now rent can be either captured by the few who own and control the land and resources, or it can be understood as created by society as a whole and thus be the proper tax base to return back to pay for community needs. And if you don't do that, if that rent stays privately as an under an income for those who happen to have grabbed more than their fair share of land and resources, what happens is it's the root of the growing wealth inequality. You have a lot of other monopoly games that come out of that original uh, maladjustment of human relationship to land and resources. So one to spend some time on Miller's book, Dying for Justice, very important because he's a medical doctor who understands the importance of inequality, wealth inequality, as it relates to health or the lack of health. He understands the effort to have like Britain does a national health service, uh, but the problem that happens when that socialized medicine is funded from taxes on labor production and taxes on rent. So it has severe consequences, even though society may be trying to provide health care for all, it's a, it's, it's, it's a lose-lose battle when it's not funded in proper source. So he's going to show why in this. So his thesis is that tens of thousands in the UK and worldwide millions die 
every year because of the injustices enshrined in the tax system. <laughs> Health and wealth, income inequality, and life expectancy. Poor have more health needs than the rich. We know that rates of sickness are linked inseparably to what can be afforded in the way of a healthy diet, decent housing, adequate heating, recreation, which does not involve use of drugs such as tobacco and alcohol, and good education. Regarding unfair access to health care, Miller says, get this banner out of the way. Miller says the reasons lie not within the ambit of medical practice, but in a political economy that finds itself bereft of policies to tackle the root causes of poverty. Within OECD countries, those with the highest life expectancy were not the richest, but those with the least inequality of income. If you wanna know what o OECD means, it's a little explanation on the bottom left. And this little graph, the, the factors driving the, the poverty cycle, there's like, 10 listed there. But according to Miller and, and, and our analysis with the Henry George School, what might be seen to be a factor driving the poverty cycle and therefore the need for all these many, many different approaches to solve the pro poverty problem and the wealth inequality problem is that these, these roots that they show in the image are actually the problem of a deeper injustice. And uh, we'll go into why privatized rent is that key. So he says there's a poverty of effective policies. And uh, us committed and knowing full well the importance of social, economic, and environmental de determinants of poor health, they know all this. So government has initiated a flurry of programs to achieve its targets. But Miller says, I'm afraid that like many previous initiatives, they are built on sand. You'll keep trying to roll this heavy ball uphill against gravity and it'll keep rolling back on you. So he asked in chapter four, private finance or fiscal reform. Well, the great land sell off, what did the NHS, the National Health Services of, of Britain do when they couldn't get enough funding to support the health needs? Uh, they started selling off the land that they owned, that the government owned for immediate one-time profit. Uh, he pointed out that uh, outdoor recreation is very important for health for people who are living in the cities. So if these hospitals know that, the medical professionals know that, but yet they were selling off uh, open space uh, that could be for recreation and parks that the government owned, they were selling it off to then fund the medical services. So it was no win. Uh, they had temporary closure of hospital facilities to avoid overspending. Uh, to relieve a financial crisis, a medical scanner costing millions of pounds was rented out to treat household pets. A spokesman said that the trust, Bedford Hospital, did not have the staff or funds to run the equipment full time for patients. Isn't that wild? Can you imagine? Economists appreciate that the majority of taxes generate a net loss of wealth. Should income tax be increased by 5% to fund the growth of the NH or other aspects of the welfare state? This will affect an economic loss to the nation in the region of 15 billion Great Britain pounds. The direct link between income and health means that when families lose income directly to taxation and the effects of taxation damage their prospects of a decent wage and housing, then their health is put in jeopardy. It is not surprising that the government should be puzzled by the ever spiraling cost of welfare. Like a dog chasing his tail, government spends faster and faster without ever closing in on his goals for welfare. Now, I'm drawing from his book. I, I hope you'll be able to see that even though it's he's looking at the UK, it applies very much to the United States and, and other countries under neoliberal economics just as well. It's just that I don't know of anybody who's writing on this topic in the United States, or I would have included that. So his chapter five is on towards the health dividend. Successive governments have fretted over how to respond to an apparently unbounded healthcare. Little thought is given to how we might reduce demand while increasing revenue. The answer is to be found in the health dividend, raising the health of the populace 
and the wealth of the economy by reforming the way we raise public revenue. No one doubts that the taxation of wages and savings is detrimental to the public's desire to fund shared services. So from where should we obtain the finance? There is one logical source only, the rents due in equity for the benefits of the people, for the benefits people receive from the abuse, use of land and resources. Clarity in public policy will follow only if we retrieve an understanding of the concepts of classical economics. Mysteriously, for a language as rich as English, there's no word in common use for the return to land that matches wages of labor and interest on capital. It is as if it were a taboo topic. But there is a lost word for profits going specifically to land in its economic sense, as first discerned by the classical economists, and this word is rent. Neither government nor economic advisors nor the general public has a vocabulary necessary for meaningful discussion of land. This lack of the necessary word exposes a cultural blind spot, a lack of perception of what land is really about and why land in both the economic and real estate census is handled so woefully in all discussions about the equitable distribution of income and wealth. We lack the necessary word because we do not see nor care to see what is before our eyes. So this is not taught in the vast majority of our universities. Uh, people are not exposed to this classical economics analysis because of the corruption of economics. I, as a young woman, was searching to try to understand root causes of poverty, inequality, war, and many social problems. I did not gain the insight until I took my first course, which is a short five-week course at the Henry George School of Social Science in San Francisco. And I'm telling you, my eyes open wide. It's like an economic enlightenment. If you don't get this from my short five weeks, please keep learning about this so that you too have this sense that you no longer have a blind spot and you can really see and understand the root causes of so many problems. It will be well worth your while. Rent is best conceived as a communal income suited to the common welfare of everyone in the community. Inequality reigns when the state allows rent to be privatized, and the taxes on the productive sector. But such taxes are a burden. They create economic inefficiencies and they therefore cause the need for welfare. So again, this image is so important. I just want to kind of really embed that image, take a picture of it in your mind. The three factory economics that rent is about a third of GDP. This is created by society. This belongs to society. Societies funded through rent solve many, many problems. They have a fair economy and a fair distribution of wealth and plenty of worthwhile work to do because the taxes on wage wages and productive endeavors, productive capital are removed. So to verify this understanding is one of the greatest economists on earth that doesn't get nearly enough attention by the mainstream. He was a former chief economist of the World Bank, but later, you know, he protested at the World Bank. There was a huge World Bank protests in Washington, D.C. a number of years ago. I participated in them. And he was out there in the street protesting the World Bank, Joseph Stiglitz. He said, in an, in, in an egalitarian society, the tax on land raises just enough revenue to finance the optimally chosen level of government expenditures. <coughs> so Professor Martin Feldstein of Harvard, one of the reasons why economists have long been interested in a tax on pure rental income is that it is a tax without excess burden. Because the owners of land cannot alter the supply of land, the tax induces no distortions and therefore no welfare loss. I could have put another 30 to 50 slides in of quotes of, of high profile people in the last 50 to 100 years 
that have said similar things. It's amazing how many well-known people have endorsed this policy, and yet so few have heard about it. So his chapter six is the poverty pandemic. Uh, his book was written well before this current pandemic, but he chose that title uh, years ago for this chapter, the poverty pandemic. Ever since 1910, income taxes have grown except inexorably while direct collection of rents has been ignored. That's when the corruption of economics happened, folks. As a result, in relative terms, the gap in health and life expectancy between social and socioeconomic groups has grown and grown. The welfare state lacks the power to overcome those deeply entrenched features in British society, and US as well, that are in many ways responsible for the need for so much welfare provision. Investment in the local standard of health, clean environment, better housing, safe streets, improved hospitals, medical care, translates into an economic impact that will be captured as rent. This is bolded out, very important to understand. All these improvements that we make result in an increase in the land rent. But if that land rent that's created by these public benefits gets captured by the few, then we don't really get ahead because the wealth inequality grows and we're back at, at square one. So. The five class model, and you know, this has been the, so, the social stratifications, extreme ones, uh, have been going on for millennia. So, the distribution of privatized rent defines social class in a succinct way. The working class possesses none, the middle class possesses a little, the upper middle class more, the highest echelons of society hold the most. So when you hear that a handful of billionaires own as much wealth as half the population or more, and their wealth is growing during a pandemic, you know that this is ultimately the result of massive unearned income beginning with the basis of the privatized rent. Even if the privatized rent comes in the form of capturing certain patents that cre created by, by intellectual uh, endeavors of many people, but then somebody enclosed that knowledge into a patent. That's an example of enclosure. Bill Gates is a good example of that. He's gone from being very clever at patenting, pushing others out, building Microsoft. And then, however, the wealth accumulates, it's usually invested in land. So now he's the number one owner of agricultural land resources in the United States. We talked about that in previous sessions. Okay, all other features are mainly secondary characteristics as simple as fundamental as that. More than any other factor, privatized rent confers privilege for some, one benefit being their low mortality rate, and the deni denial of an equal share of rent to others bequeaths them a relatively high mortality rate. So Miller's a medical doctor, as I said, he's trying to figure out how to have people be healthy. He's looking at their national health service He's understanding this classical economics rent, and his whole book is about that. Truman is flipping a coin to a beggar. It comes to see that an edifice which produces beggars needs restructuring. So we're we talking about free distributed justice. What we hear about is post distributive justice. Let me tell you what that means. We have extreme wealth inequality. The narrative is how do we tax the rich? How do we grab the money back? They have too much. Very hard to tax the rich in a lot of ways because they hide it in offshore tax shelters and so on. And they have a way of ownership. So the shift here is to go from tax the bad rich guys to pre-distributive justice, it means you have justice in the factors of land, labor, and capital, and the return to those factors of wages, interest, and rent. So with that kind of fairness at the very root, you just simply, the wealth is not going to concentrate in the hands of the few. It can't happen. So collecting rent for society is a good start 
but it's not enough. It's imperative that there be a commensurate reduction in taxation on the productive sector. Only then will the full fruits of this radical overhaul in fiscal policy be harvested. It therefore behoves the people to equip themselves with independent knowledge of the economic principles of sound public policies so that they can make an issue of taxation and general elections. Britain has evolved a vicious cycle in which taxes on wages and production damage the economy and turn poverty into a national institution. I mean, I hope you can see it's the same. It's a major cause of health for which the welfare state is obliged to provide health care. The increased demand for welfare forces the government to raise more taxes, initiating a repetition of the cycle with further damage to production and an intensification of poverty and dependency. This enriches a few and impoverishes the many. So even though you're trying to solve a problem, if you don't get to the root, you're just creating even greater wealth inequality. By the way, this image of the earth, we talked about unity and with eco consciousness, the left side is it's really ugly like scorched earth. That's the kind of degraded society we have under a witch eco consciousness. And then under unity consciousness, you have flourishing, bright, vital vitality. The cycle can be reversed only by judiciously repealing taxes on wages and production while at the same time collecting the rent. We showed this a couple of sessions ago. Uh, this is uh, from the Australians GDP, but we're, we're finding it is pretty much across the board in other countries under neoliberal economics. Um, if you look back at 1911, the gray is the land rent. Uh, the dark pink is taxation on wages and capital. And the 85%, the blue, is the income on labor and production, productive capital. And then you fast forward a century, you see the land and resource rent is growing. As society, as the economy develops, rent grows. But there's more social needs. The government levies more taxes, but they're levying it on income and capital, labor and capital. And then you see the blue, the return to income and capital wages, 85% drops down to 48%. So even if one's wages are increasing overall, the other costs of living are increasing even faster, like housing. And so wages just can't keep up with the cost of living uh, in a society structured like ours because the land rent leaks to the hands of the few. Now, the next few slides, we're gonna look at how to reverse that by understanding how to work with tax policy so that that pink, which is taxes from all levels of government on labor and production is untaxed. That's gonna increase net incomes of labor and capital quite a bit. If you take those taxes off, it's gonna bring it back up at 24% and 48%. The tax on the land and resource rent, the 26%, and it can be higher, Rule of thumb is about one third. By the way, the little red ribbon is the 2%, is the amount of the land rent that is captured, which is pretty minor, 2% or less. So we wanna increase that and capture all the land rent. So from the land rent, there is more than enough to pay for social needs. And then there's still a good, strong, productive society. So it balances the public and the private sector. So, we can build a system of public finance that will strengthen and maximize, maximize incentives for fair distribution of wealth, environmental protection, efficient wealth production, provision of adequate government services, and even the peaceful resolution of territorial conflicts. We'll have a few slides on that. We wanna reduce or eliminate taxes on labor created wealth. And that means slashing taxes on income, especially from wages and payroll, <clears throat> from capital, especially of sustainable quality and sales taxes, especially for basic necessities and homes and other homes and other buildings. We want housing, we want good housing. Why, why tax our housing? 
Um, the reason we're saying, especially of this or that, is we just can't do all this all at once like overnight. It's a gradual, gradual process. So this would be where you would focus the reduction or elimination of taxes. Uh, well, we want drastic reduction or complete removal of subsidies for energy production, resource extraction, polluting industries, agriculture and forestry, investments designed to exclude labor from production. Now, agriculture and forestry, the, the great amount of the subsidies go to the top percent, the biggest, largest agribusinesses, not going to the small farmers. We're saying none of the, the, the subsidies are unfair. There are market distortion. Why should hardworking people pay? Because most of these subsidies are going to oil corporations and other big corporations who captured, uh, captured in many ways government and therefore have had the power to give themselves subsidies or to reduce or eliminate their taxes. And that's just, just a, a, a totally unfair and it, it's damaging to the social, social body. Where we wanna draw the commons rent, surface land sites. That's where a lot of land rent concentrates in the, in the core areas of the city. Cities who need the most uh, services actually have a sufficient tax base on the land rent. And then emissions into air, water, or soil. These are pollution taxes. The challenge there is when you add Gluvian or pollution taxes, you actually get the incentive to reduce, hopefully, the pollution, and then you lose your tax base. You don't usually lose your tax base with the top one, the surface land sites. Uh, common rents domain of timber, grazing, and mining land use. There's a lot of mining on our federal lands. They pay very little or below market value rates for access to our federal lands. Uh, timber, you have uh, the state of Maine, massive owned by timber corporations, uh, very little of the land rent collected for the state. Oil and minerals, same thing, water resources, so that water is used more carefully and not hoarded by a few or not have any profit incentive. Electromagnetic spectrum, all of our broadcast bands, some parts of the spectrum are more valuable than others. Uh, those who have access to that without paying a fair rent have an unfair advantage in terms of broadcast systems and in the spectrum. Geo-orbital zones <laughs> are those areas in outer space where you can put the satellites balanced between the gravity of the earth and the moon. So there's actually high real estate values out there in outer space. So they really have a rental value. So I, I could present a whole you know, sections on case studies of land value tax, uh, but I try in my presentations to connect a lot of dots to see, show how these various issues really are, are very well connected and how uh, through proper public finance, we can address many social problems. So I'm just gonna have two case studies of land value tax and I want to point out the importance of using uh, geographic indicator systems, the uh, um, land value mapping. Uh, this is one of hundreds that we have now. Uh, those land acre from Minneapolis, Minnesota. We have these land maps down to uh, mapping per square foot, uh, city site by site, block by block. But I just want you to see that these big spikes in the middle of Minneapolis. Uh, they are land values. And so think of the value of urban land sites like oil wells or gold mines in the middle of the city. Oil wells or gold mines that could very well finance infrastructure and many, many social needs of our cities, but are not being tapped because they're owned and controlled by a few who are paying little or no of the pro none of the property tax. So in Pennsylvania, there are people working on this for a hundred years uh, in this policy approach, land value tax. So there was up to 20 cities in the state that had been shifting their taxes off homes and other buildings and onto the land rent. It's through a simple property tax reform, you, although citizens still must pay state and federal income taxes, this split rate or two tier approach has proven benefits. We're saying that the property tax is two different taxes. It's a good one and a bad one. Never please work to eliminate your local property tax. 
because you're just going to open your town or city to speculation, land hoarding, and all sorts of problems and, and, and housing, lack of housing affordability. This understands that the property collects some of the land rent, but it also is taxed top heavy on our houses and our buildings, our built environment. So because we want more and better housing, we want to take the taxes off of labor and capital in the property tax and shift it just onto land value tax. This is brilliantly and elegantly easy to do, easy to, uh, to figure out how to do it, say gradually over five years or 10 years. Uh, and that, that's been the approach. Uh, the, the challenge is to get the town council to, uh, to do it. You have to do educating. So in 1982, Harrisburg was, uh, or it's our state capital, Pennsylvania, population 50,000, was second on the national list of distressed cities. We've been declining for three decades. Uh, it was desperate. So it gradually restructured its tax base and, and then tax land value six times heavier than building value. According to the Harrisburg Office of Business and Industrial Development, the number of structures, some 4,200 in 1982, became less than 500. And the city was actually voted the second best investment city in the Eastern US two consecutive, consecutive years. Crime and fire rates dropped while businesses and private sector jobs and house production increased. I'd seen newspaper headings say, we don't know how Mayor Reed is performing this, but um, it's actually taxes are lowering on, on the majority of the people. And yet we have more funding for parks and fire prevention, security uh, forces, and all good things. So this is what he was doing. <laughs> so Mayor Reed said, long-term mayor, he said, the city of Harrisburg continues in the view that a land value taxation system, which places a much higher tax rate on land than on improvements, is an important incentive for the highest and best use of land in already developed communities, such as cities. Then we have our third largest city of Allentown, 1990s, it started taxing buildings less than land after a popular vote. Now that's interesting, the popular vote, people voted on this one. In fact, they voted twice because a few large owners of a few valuable but underutilized land sites in Allentown, uh, wealthy owners of these land sites launched an effort to, to, to shift the vote to have people vote against it, but they lost. The voters again voted for freezing or reducing all other local taxes and only uh, increasing the land value tax. Okay, that was a big major vote for economic democracy. So, according to analysis by the Center for the Study of Economics, Allentown's new construction and renovation thereupon grew by 32% in dollar value in the three years after the shift to land value taxation as compared to the prior three years. What does that mean? It means infill develop, in development. It means sites that were underutilized, got put to good use because of the pressure of taxing those sites, become a good working capitalist, hire labor and capital and, and fix up those boarded up buildings and make improvements. Now they compared Allentown to nearby Bethlehem, Pennsylvania that had a lot more subsidies from the federal government. Allentown was doing much, much better. For subsidies coming from the federal government, if you don't capture the increase in land value back for the people, it's, it's not gonna help the people at all. It's just gonna take from the tax treasury. Okay, a little word from, remember I said, uh, Swami B on the MIC, military industrial complex, an obsessive and compulsive disorder of the body politic, whereby a society's wealth is hoarded and hidden behind the fence. We're just gonna have a few more slides. I just felt I had to share with you these handful of very powerful graphs because it tells a big story in a few images and because our military industrial complex has been draining so much money from the public coffers and the military industrial complex is the largest polluter, the largest polluter on earth. Okay. What's this though? So, okay, these are two robins fighting. Now, a couple of months ago, I was looking in my backyard 
I saw five robins fighting. Okay, robins fight in the spring for territory. They're defining locations where they're gonna have their nests. We humans are territory animals. Being territorial animals, we need territory for ourselves to survive. But it's high time we humans stop fighting over territory, over land and resources. Even though these birds have a battle and they fight, nobody was killed. No, none of the birds died. There was no blood on the ground after that skirmish that I saw. That was their way of working out the conflict of defining their territory. We need to be able to do as least as well as the wild creatures about not killing each other, but instead sharing the earth's land and resources. So essentials of economic rent and war economy. In a naturally just and harmonious society, everyone has fair access to the gifts of nature in order to procure their livelihood. People access to land resources, create the wealth they need. There's no obstruction in the flow. But a privileged fund grows. When, how? See the guns. The guns are over rent and interest. Interest meaning return to labor, to re return to productive capital. Rent meaning the return factor that's captured the land. So when people must pay rent for access to land, exploitation of labor begins. Because of the rent leak, people cannot get capital without borrowing from the privileged fund lending system and paying interest. So that's where the mortgage problem comes in. You're not making some way to really buy a house. Uh, you have to borrow, but um, you're going to be borrowing at, 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 at certain rates that uh, just add on to the cost of the house. So this privileged fund that the rent and the interest leaks into the hands of the few who own the, the land resource and banking systems. We're calling that unearned income or the privilege fund. So collectors of the privilege fund invest in land and resources in underdeveloped so-called countries. And to quell protests, investors call for military intervention. Now, are they investing in these land and resources or are they making, or are they also making deals with certain political elites to control land and resources. There's many ways that privileged fund holders manage to enclose, capture, and get control of other countries' land and, and natural resources. Um, but anyhow, this is saying they're investing in it. One way or the other, they're out there getting land and resources. And the, the natives are getting restless. They don't like having their land taken away. What we're going to take before we get to the last slide, we're going to look at what's on the news this week everywhere. You can look at Afghanistan. It's only a, a little bit um, smaller than the state of, of Texas, just by 48,700 square kilometers. But you can see in the map, the most com comparable size of Afghanistan is Texas. Now, this is the geologic and mineral resources of Afghanistan. You just see where the, the, the colors are through the whole heart of the country. And the other slides are going to tell you more what some of these resources are. But if I look at other states, there's nothing like the mineral wealth in Afghanistan, in all of the United States. It's extraordinarily mineral rich territory where the riches are hidden. So the little in the boxes, those are the areas rich in minerals. You see where Kabul is, Kandahar, the Lodis. So look at the list of all these mineral resources and you have rare earth elements, very valuable. And the last on the list is lithium. You know, large deposits of lithium, what is gonna hold the charge on the solar batteries for a solar society? It's lithium, extremely important resource valuable resource, large deposits in Afghanistan. What was the US motive for the war with Afghanistan? This is a really recent, this was just to August 15th that came out by consortium news editor. Uh, it's these, these, these are the sorts of things that have always seemed more important to US interests than schoolgirls reading a book. It seemed a main reason was control of Afghanistan's vast untapped mineral wealth. 
why would the U.S. leave that behind? Perhaps one should not be surprised in the not too distant future to see U.S. companies negotiating for digging rights with the Taliban. After all, in the 1990s, U.S. oil company Unilocal flew Taliban leaders to Houston, remember Bush did that, to work on a pipeline deal. So here's, again, that slide that shows the privileged fund growing into a war economy. Now, we wanna transform the privilege fund. We want essentially a new role for, for democratic governance. Uh, we want democratic governance to now evolve, to affirm the human right to land and resources as a, as a right by birthright. We want the surplus value or the unearned income accruing to our land and natural resources to go into a resource rent fund, ACA land value tax, or other ways to capture this unearned income for the community, for the society. So we want to take away this privilege fund by having a fair land tenure and tax system and the surplus value going democratically to finance the needs of we the people. So in this uh, chart, the Privilege Fund is equitably returned to society by public collection of land and resource rents, and workers with their just economic opportunities restored can now accumulate capital through their own savings. Economic justice, abundance, and peace are restored. <clears throat> These kinds of funds established anywhere there's conflict over territory is what can resolve those conflicts by fair share rights to those land and resource rents. Now the the previous one, it showed the arrow of the gun above interest. I have, as many of you have probably been looking at the money problem. And Henry George also looked at the money problem, but he was writing about it later in his life. And he died of a stroke when he ran his second time for mayor of New York. So he didn't get to complete the science of political economy. But we know he was looking at the money problem. Um, I'm not an expert in the money problem, but I have come to see the value of this. Public bank. And Ellen Brown, who's a founder of the public bank, has written quite, quite a lot of books on it. Uh, we have done uh, previously with the Henry George School, uh, a um, economics of war and peace, where we went into the public banking ideas. But there's the websites for that. Uh, and talking to, to people who advocate for land value tax and work in, in the cities for it. Some of them have come to see that uh, importance of having a, a public bank to store the tax funds for the people's needs for the community. So this is the last slide. It's just showing you, uh, I had previously drew your attention to uh, my book, The Earth Belongs to Everyone. Uh, there's 30 articles and essays. Uh, a lot of the ideas that I'm presenting are presented in various chapters in my book. And I had uh, directed you to a pre PDF, free PDF at the IU.org. Uh, please enroll in further Henry George School classes and webinars and seminars. And then this wonderful little book called, called Tax Shift. It's, it's quite, quite good and elegant. Northwest Environment Watch. Uh, their analyses and recommendations have become the basis for, uh, for government uh, tax shift policies. So there you have it. That's what I brought to you tonight. And we have still at least a half an hour for discussion. Um, I wanna know if you think you've got a clear understanding of, of land rent, of rent, what, what we mean by rent, because that's very key. And uh, we might wanna talk about Afghanistan or, or other current events. But first, let's, if you could in the discussion or conversations, um, start by addressing information presented in this PowerPoint. And, and then we can still have time to, to talk about Afghanistan, if you like. Okay, thank you for your attention. Thank you, Alana. Uh, we are open for the Q&A. So anyone has a question, go ahead. You should be able to unmute yourselves. I don't see any uh, questions or comments. Oh, I would Rob, 
thank Alana yeah. once again for a wonderful presentation. Uh, very informative. Very much appreciated. Welcome. Sure, go ahead, Rob. You have. A... Okay, uh, Joe Polito, and then Yanis. Hi, uh, most interesting. Um, uh, I, I'm curious about uh, the woman you introduced us to, Anastasia, was it? Yes. Um, uh, have you met her, did you say? And uh, where can people read about her? And uh, you, know, oh. she mentioned, you mentioned that she was part of a particular ethnic group. Um, is that group? still around um what language did she speak uh it, just a very interesting uh i know you don't um you can't be an expert in everything but it, it sounded like a really interesting topic it, it, thanks so much for your interest because I, i'm just smiling as i'm thinking about her and the information no i have not met her very few people have met her in person um she lives uh, in Siberia. She speaks Russian. She's Russian, Russian territory. So up the Ob, Ob River in the wilderness off the river. And uh, the fascinating story after the Soviet Union fell apart and the entrepreneurs were rising, uh, this entrepreneur, uh, Vat, um, Vladimir Migre, uh, rented a, a boat and he was on a little trade mission up that, up that river trading with the villagers and also having providing some on-ship entertainment for them. And so it goes how he actually uh, met her father, grandfather and great grandfather. And they wanted to um, introduce him. They wanted him to take his crew out to this Siberian uh, cedar tree that was 500 years old and had toppled because the wood is considered very valuable of those old trees. And, uh, Migre decided it was a crazy idea and he wasn't going to do it. But uh, he, after his trip, he got ill and he spent quite a bit of time in the hospital. And he was reading about the cedar trees and he saw that the cedar oil could make him a lot of profit. So he came looking for them next trip up river and instead ran into her. She took him off to a visit. He thought he would go to her place and have a cup of tea. But her place was just a clearing in the wilderness. And she was able to survive quite well because of her attunement with the natural world and with the squirrels and the bears and the wolves and all of the eagles. And she was uh, incredibly in tune with this uh, natural family. So uh, three days with her and his mind was so blown by what he experienced with her. And she said, now write a book about what you learned that he couldn't even work as an entrepreneur anymore. He ended up writing the book. He was in Moscow. He was impoverished. Uh, he found a publisher. He ended up selling this book on a street corner and people would buy one and they'd come back and they'd buy five more. Fast forward, it's been translated into 15 languages. There are nine books about her and all that he's learned from his trips with her. And it's become quite a phenomenon. So not only is she omniscient, really knows about just about every everything, some Expanded minds are, are like that. We know from yoga studies and so She has a very down to earth vision for human society of having a uh, small two and a half, three, three acre homesteads for every family that wants one. And then she shares how you can live and be self-reliant on three acres within a neighborhood of these three acres homesteads. She talks about how Russian culture a thousand years ago used to live this way and, and how their land tenure and their system got disrupted. So Joe, if you wanna call me later, I can talk more about her, but you go to get these books to the Ringing, let's see, Ringing Cedar books, the Ringing Cedars of, si of, of Siberia. So you go to the website, Ringing Cedars, and you can get one of the, or you can just get the whole series. Uh, sometimes you can get them uh, used, but um, some people, I mean, they've been reviewed. The information's been reviewed by professionals in many fields. 
And they say that the knowledge in those books has taken them to a whole other level in their professional understanding of their field. And as I say, there's many fields that she covers. Um, they once, this is an interesting thing about, they, as, as word of her got out, this Wichigo consciousness that wants to grab and take, they actually set an expedition to try to capture her, like you huh. capture a wild animal. And first they tried to convince her that, oh, we have this nice place by our university. It's all set up. You'll be very comfortable. It's like a nature preserve. You know, like you put an animal in a nice zoo. Well, she was having none of it. And when she wasn't going to go into the helicopter or whatever they sent, they actually brought out their guns and a bullet went right on the side of her head. And then she kind of went into her superpower pose and, and managed to get, get them to leave. But, you know, rather than honoring, respecting this person, that's what uh, the Watiko consciousness tries to do and control power system. But in asking, you asked me also about what was her background. She's a remnant. Her, her ancestry is a remnant. It's not a predominant clan. It's, it's a small remnant that's lived with the unbroken cultural values and understandings from the ancient Vedic culture of thousands of years ago. It was a worldwide Vedic culture, a very high culture. And they have kept that thread of wisdom all the centuries, thousands of years now. I've gone on a bit with this because it's so interesting to me and I hope to you too to hear about her. And the Vedic uh, land value tax book that I brought up shows that those times there was a fair land tenure system and even a land value tax. But now let's see, there's Yanis and Ron Rubin and please have your questions and comments. Yes, uh, thank you. Thank you, Alana. A very, very wide spectrum from the, um, uh, you know, from the realistic, the practical to the theoretical. And I, I, I really like the, the, the presentation today. We have to keep, all these perspectives open. We Thank shouldn't you. just be on the ground. We should also have our eyes to the sky and, and aspire for something um, higher mm. than what, what we currently have. So mm -hmm. we should keep this balanced approach and I, re and I really appreciate uh, your Good. presentation. Good, I, I have I have a two bones to pick. Um, the, the one I think, I, I, Ron will address it, so I will skip it. I will not uh, raise it now because I think Ron will raise it and then we can discuss it then. Mm -hmm. uh, but the first one is I sense some antinomy here because we say, oh, we have to take the rent that is being uh, bled out of the uh, worker, the producer, from the landlord, and then we're going to take it from the landlord and, you know, and give it to the government. Now, the rent collectors, usually they hold the means of production, okay? So basically, whatever government wants to invest in, okay, some rent collector will go there and say, oh, I can provide this service for you, government, and here is the price. So that explains why. So, so government is being taken for a ride, okay, by, by, by the rent collector. Solve the problem by taxing the rent, but then the landlords go from the other side and they collect the tax spending from the government. So in other words, they, 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 the government takes it from the one pocket and then the, the the, the rent collectors, they go and they take it from the government, they put it back in, the, in their other pocket. So that's an antinomy. And that is something that we, we have to be cautious because that's exactly what's happening uh, currently. The government is the enabler of inequality. And we think that the social welfare programs are good, but actually they're doing, it's a double whammy of bad. First of all, because they make, make people dependent on government, it's a standard colonial trick to bribe the, colon, the, the, the colonized with some easy money, then they stop the, their production and then they are crippled forever. 
So that's that's the number one ill of the social welfare programs. And the, the, the second ill is that these welfare programs, let's think of healthcare, for example, are actuated by private entities, medical landlords, for example, big pharma, big insurance, which they love the government to spend. They love the government to borrow because they're on the, on the receiving end of it. So I think we should be extremely cautious when we talk about taxation and funding of government through rent. I think that's, that's actually a self-defeating purpose and an invitation for corruption. And that's my first comment. And I think the second one will arrive when okay. Ron asks okay. this, this question. Okay. But, but, but I would like you to, call, to, to comment on, on this antinomy. This is an important issue. Uh, there's people come from the left and the right. And once they understand the rent issue, they completely agree on that. But some are, are okay with government and some are very much not, not trusting government expending the funds. I see two ways around that. One is the people should be able to vote on their government expenditure. So you're collecting it from the proper source with his rent. And then you have the people's budget process, which is in quite a number, large number of cities now. I mean, a couple of dozen at least where the people themselves are voting on 50% of their city budget. So when you have a simplified tax system and it's all transparent and online, the people can see where their money coming from and where it's going. And then they need to empower themselves with the decision-making democratic power to, to how those funds are directed. Some communities might wanna give a, a dividend like they do in Alaska, the permanent fund from the oil resources every year, they get a dividend check in October every man, woman, and child. So some cities might wanna have more that just refund the, the rent back and dividend checks to the citizenry and have less government services. And others might wanna do have more government services. I think it's gonna balance out between those two where you start having the ethics of a good government. But I think the people's budget process is an important, important thing for us to advocate for. That's a very good point. And I think it's a good compliment to uh, the LVT. And I think that also reconciles uh, both of your points and that of Yanis. So let's go to Ron. Yes, um, Alana, thank you very much for presenting so much uh, material for um, consideration. Uh, I especially wanna thank you for introducing the idea of Wichiko consciousness versus unity consciousness. Um, but the point I want to talk about is Yannis suggested, um, and I put it in the chat, Yannis uh, wrote, um, the rent value is created by the person or collection of persons that pay it. It's not the community that creates it. So I'd like to discuss that quote. And uh, because you ask if we, uh, uh, understand economic rent. And uh, very uh, briefly, as I could uh, state it, if uh, we can make a, an imaginary um, in our mind, supposing that uh, on the island of Manhattan, everybody leaves and just Giannis, myself, and Ibrahim remain, okay? Um, there will be no economic rent because each of us will have plenty of land uh, as good as the other two people, and there will be no economic rent. Economic rent will not uh, arise until enough uh, people come back to the island where some of them are going to have to take inferior locations. That's when rent arises. And the more people you have, um, the rent is going to increase because uh, people are going to be uh, um, pushed out further and further to the margins. And at the same time, because of all the people arriving, there's going to be a tremendous increase in the uh, production. But at the same time, the percentage of that production going to rent will be continuously increasing as less and less um, of the total product will be due to uh, labor and more and more of it will be uh, due to the advantages of location. So um, maybe uh, that was a little long-winded and, and uh, maybe it, some people don't get it. So 
uh, Alana or Ibrahim or anybody else either questions or, or a better explanation? Uh, well, no, Ron, that's true. I mean, as population grows, the rent grows. As any kind of improvements happen on that land base, be it in any infrastructure, education, sanitation, the land values go up. Uh, assuming you guys were there first, uh, if you captured all that land rent, you'd be very wealthy and then you'd establish the banks. Uh, but assuming that we have a fair land capture system, uh, you would maybe want to pay to have those more valuable sites. So uh, by excluding others in your more valuable sites, you would pay for that exclusion. You would pay more into the public fund than others on less desirable sites. So the city would be able to finance services for everybody on an equitable basis. Now, everybody pays with a land rent system. You might live in a multi-unit apartment building and your landlord might be paying the land rent check as taxes to the government, but you can be assured that there's some percentage of your rent for your apartment that's actually going to pay as a pass-through to pay the land rent. So everybody's paying some land rent. Uh, those with the more and better land pay more because they have uh, an advantage. So they're paying for their advantage. They're just not taking advantage. And in many cases, um, those who have more figure, well, they don't wanna pay the extra taxes and they start releasing those lands. So you see uh, that there can be no land speculation and no land hoarding, but good site utilization. So everybody becomes uh, productive because there is nothing to be made uh, by just sitting on land and capturing the rent. Uh, let me make, since I wrote this, this quote, and of course I agree with, 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 with Ron, but the, the problem, Ron, is that community is not well-defined, okay? And not all, everybody in the community contributes the same to the, to, to, to the rental values that, that accrue. So taken from a producer and given to somebody who doesn't work, that, 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 that doesn't seem economically fair. And let me give an analogy so you can understand my mindset. If somebody was mugged on the street and he was robbed, like and the, 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 the thief took thousand dollars from, from his wallet, right? And then he, the, the thief is caught. Imagine now the police saying, instead of giving this thousand dollars stolen back to the person that it was stolen from, you say, oh no, we're gonna distribute it all among all of us. And here is a dollar for you and a dollar for, for, for him and a do, do, dollar for the guy who have nothing to do with, the, with how that thousand dollars was created. Okay, that's not a fair system. And this simple analogy, I hope elucidates what I meant to, 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 with, with, with what I wrote. So if, if I'm being robbed as a rent payer, okay, the, the first fair thing to do is to have the landlord refund me from what he stole from me, okay? And then I can willfully donate it for community causes, for, for whatever other, you know, uh, needs uh, that I feel like giving to. And people, because- Okay, Giannis- uh, they are, Hold on. Okay, they Giannis, Alana. Giannis, I wanna address it quickly because there's other questions and we only have 15 minutes. It's not, according to what you give or make or produce. I think it's impossible to kind of divvy up. I produce this, therefore I get this amount of rent. This is a birthright issue. This is the earth is the birthright of all people. Every child has a birthright to planet earth, not by what they work for or contribute. A child freshly born has a birthright to the earth. And we're saying this is a birthright as a human being to the land rent and their society that's created by all the society. So there's lots of contributions made. Everybody has a contribution. You mentioned some kind of theft. The theft and the crimes would be greatly reduced in a fair society. So I think we may have some different understanding here, but we can't go into it any further, but thanks Giannis, because there's Joe and Richard. Richard has, Richard has his hand up. Richard, go ahead. Hey, Alana, very good presentation. I, I agree with what Yana said. It's uh, good to have the psycho uh, 
religious or philosophical viewpoint. Uh, I maybe this will answer something that Giannis and Ron are talking about when you when you use the term unearned income. Uh, do you mean to to be actually taxing it, or do you mean something else? Uh, in other words, like if if uh, Ron and Giannis owned all of Manhattan and everybody left, nobody they're not going to generate any unearned in income. They're not going to uh, they'll own all the land, but it takes human human actors to uh, to actually generate it or materialize, make it materialize. So uh, that that should be taxed, in my opinion, not not the property tax, uh, not the land only property tax that or what we call the LVT. So. Well, we, we, I don't know, I mean, that, that the um, unearned income, there's many forms of unearned income. We call that privilege, right. getting a free lunch for nothing. Yeah, and patent income. What, yeah, yeah, there's, but like Henry George is talking about the mother of all monopolies. He's right. just saying that if you address this primary, dysfunctional, unfair human relationship to the land, with a land value tax, a, a, a socializing the, the commons rent, it will make it so much easier for society to then deal with the other kinds of unearned income. Right. And if you don't start with the root unearned income, you try to address the branches of the tree and not the root, it's kind of hard to do because you keep having the wealth accumulate at the source to the, to the few who, who own and control land and resources. It's just looking at the really deep basic relationship of all wealth, tangible wealth, comes from labor on land resources, Richard. Okay. Oh. Joe? Okay. Thank you. Um, You're welcome. Uh, one, of the, one of the words you use, which really uh, <clears throat> struck home to me was uh, enclosure. And I, I thought a little bit about the enclosure of the commons when you were talking about it. And I think the commons kind of goes back to this more unity consciousness or uh, what Tiki, I think you said consciousness. Yeah, with Tico. Um, with Tico. Um, in that, you know, in, in tribal life, pre almost pre-civilization, you know, we the, the land was a gift and people uh wandered around it and gathered food and hunted and uh respected it and left it unaltered and so forth um and you know after that it was still sort of in common even though they developed some agriculture and grazing and so forth and i guess england's the most famous case but but the the other thing that kind of struck me is in these two consciousness that you talked about it it the, to me, all humanity is pretty much the same. You can put them in different locations, different circumstances. They'll, they'll behave in a very similar fashion. Uh, there's no magic to it. We've, we've had thousands of years of learning and truth seeking and trial and error. And I think uh, the world is a lot better off than it was, but you know, our success is now kind of our enemy and we have to make sure that uh, we address climate change and everything. But, you know, the Aboriginal communities, let's say North America, for example, um, in, you know, they, they, they warred with each other, they captured each other, they enslaved each other. When they moved south and I guess in friendlier climes, developed better civilizations, the May Mayans, the Aztecs and so forth, they had, uh, uh, you know, autocratic governments, they, they conquered, they, you know, they had uh, religions, they sacrificed people. I mean, all over the world, you know, we saw humanity go through these steps and make mistakes. And it's only in the last few hundred years that we've had a more permanent democracy and so forth. So I'm, I'm a little um, confused at the, at those two consciousness that you're talking about. Like in the very earliest of years, they were far too separated to have kind of a unified consciousness. And as they grew in size in bigger civilizations, as they moved south, those civilizations didn't seem to have, uh, seemed to me, it didn't have a lot to offer. They were just steps toward a, a you know, uh, along the, making the same mistakes that were made in all around the world. Uh, so if you could just kind of 
uh, explain to me what you know a little more about this consciousness you're talking about uh, like, i'm kind of lost well the native, the native people when the europeans came uh there they weren't violent within the tribe there were some wars yes there were some fighting over territory uh but on the whole they resolved it peacefully they had councils where they resolved their conflicts and the councils and the, the chiefs were chosen by the council of women. So there was a gender balance. When I say male, female balance, it's a psychological balance too of the uh, love and the will. So they saw the European colonizers come and they saw the men beating up their wives and they saw them beating their children, punishing their children and they were appalled. And uh, as they saw this and they saw all these lies they saw the betrayals where promises were broken over and over, treaties were broken. You couldn't, you couldn't trust the Wisikos anymore. So that's how they developed this term, Watiko, to describe a consciousness that was so violent that they found it extremely disturbing. It wasn't even in their, their mindset. I mean, early on, the colonizers would only negotiate with the male natives. They called the female natives squaws because, of course, the females in that culture were very much second class. So they they insisted on the patriarchal, number one, power structure. Uh, as I've been even visiting some of these ancient civilizations in North America, uh, they as they evolve into a hierarchical system of their own form of Wachiko consciousness, where they have the ruler up on a high plateau, and then that's when you start seeing child sacrifice and horrible things happen. They do evolve. <laughs> Some of them did evolve, like you said, a hierarchical system. So is it coming with settlement when wealth can create? So rather than nomadic, there becomes settlement, agriculture, and all these diversified economies increases land value. Societies like the Indus River Valley civilization in the Vedic times and, and others that returned the land rent to the people, they managed to keep their harmonic even as they became a complex society. So unity consciousness is, is understands, it's everything, we understand it's all connected. We are one human family. What, what each of us does impacts the rest of us. What we do to nature comes back either in a good or a bad way to us. So unity consciousness is a higher consciousness of the understanding of interrelationship. And the Wetiko is very separative. So you can kill somebody else because they're not in your tribe. Uh, Henry George was a very compassionate human being. He was also not uh, religious in a term of traditional religion, but a very spiritual person. And, he had very amazing experiences that he wrote about, about his own guidance, about how he found truth. He has a, a really deep um, respect for truth, for deeper consciousness. So, and, and we know he had four children. We all, I've only heard that he was a very good husband and a very good parent, very, very loved and respected. I, I had the fortune to meet his granddaughter daughter, uh, the famous dancer, shook hands with her in San Francisco when she was an elderly woman. Uh, um, what was her name? You guys know. Um, uh, uh, George, Agnes DeMille. Agnes DeMille was a famous dancer. So she greatly revered and wrote about her grandfather. So I just saying, as we evolve in our consciousness, we become more compassionate. And it falls on the loving people now who have unity consciousness to take that step into leadership roles to change these institutions for the better. It's, you find it in Buddhism and Christianity, it's just to do a little, each of us to play a little role in uh, addressing the suffering on, on planet earth. We're in a body for a very short time. What are we, what are we doing here? Are we gonna create harmony or destruction, you know? It's a personal choice almost. I, if, if it just, I don't want to be hurt. I don't want my family to be hurt. 
So I don't want your family to be hurt. So how do we create a world where we stop hurting each other and addressing the poverty and wealth inequality and the power imbalance issue is very much part of that. So it really comes down to each of us as an individual tuning into our higher consciousness to see what we are to do in the short time that we're here. And what we're presenting, what we hope is uh, an area that has a lot of value to create a better society. Thank you for elaborating on that. Welcome. We have uh, three additional minutes. If anyone has a question or a comment. Ron, you wanna come back? No, that's okay. Just to thank Alana again. She's doing a fantastic job. Great. Thank you. I think this was a wonderful session. So we will meet again one more time. That's going to be next week, same time, right, Alana? Correct. And I'll, I'll send this PowerPoint out as a PDF on the next day or two. Uh, I'll try to send out the outline for the next session. Okay. Uh, it's going to be very different. It's going to be some different information that you've probably never experienced through the Henry George School before because I'm gonna talk about this idea of the new leadership and how, how we can develop these qualities. I'm, I'm gonna talk about a project that I'm involved in with a team of leading Georgias for land value tax for Baltimore. I'm gonna describe that. Um, I'm probably gonna show you some slides from my, my own homestead, my, my own work in regenerative agriculture that I do in a small scale here. You might enjoy some of those photograph photos. <laughs> and then uh, I'm going to give you all an invitation to consider how we might work together in future or what particular oh, project uh, you might want to engage in. That'll be next in the last session. Thank you, Alana. Looking forward to that. Good night, Good. everyone, and see you uh, next week. Thank you, everybody. Thanks and for by, being here. And by the way, to remind you uh, that that session is on for this coming week. So we will meet again. We will meet next week on Monday. Thank you.